Hi guys and welcome to the last part of lecture 4 for 2016. Now this last part of the lecture is just on what we call practice distribution. So for this lecture if you're looking at the PowerPoint, if you just go to the slider it's got Tiger Woods on it, it's got practice distribution, that's where we're starting from for this last bit. For the last sort of four or five slides that were in that contextual interference aspect of the lecture, you don't have to worry about those in relation to exams or anything. Just focus on the, the video and that's really what we're asking you to understand. So I sort of condense the information a little bit um, just to give you that real focus on what you need to know for, for not just the exam but for your assignment and really what we're trying to teach you in these first sort of four to six weeks. So if you look now at practice distribution, so rather than looking at and that one session on its own, which was what the previous lecture was on, so we looked at varying and random practice and block practice. This lecture was look at how many sessions a week do we do and how long should each session be. And that's really what I guess the, the grunt of this whole lecture is about. And the first few slides are just on this principle of overlearning. And really what we want to focus on is rather than going through each of the, I guess, teaching points in those first sort of three slides, all we really want to go to is understand is, in order to really know and understand a skill, you have to have reached a certain level of ability. And once you've reached a certain level of ability, you need to practice more to be able to retain that level of ability. And that's all overlearning is telling us. It's not a key aspect of this major assignment or on things that are going to be the exam. All it's trying to tell us that you can't just get to a level, you need to practice beyond that if you need, if you want to retain that. So in other words, how many trials does it take for you to be able to consistently get six or seven out of 10 free throws? It might take you 100 or 200 trials. All it's saying is if you want to retain that level, you need to practice beyond 100 or 200, you need to do a little bit more in order to retain it. And that's all really overlearning is, is telling us. The main part of this lecture, which I only go for about 10 minutes, is looking at the fourth slide, which is what's called distribution of practice. So in here, we want to know the first two questions, the length and frequency of practice sessions and the length of the rest intervals between trials in each particular practice session. And this, is the, this has just got a picture of a swimming program, which tells you, you've seen on the whiteboard all the time if you've ever been to a pool, and you can see the sessions that are planned out. And this just tells you a four-week training block and looking at the weeks, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So it's almost like you know a skill training project or whatever it might be. But really what we're going to look at here is the length of a session, and this is where I think it is just really important for us to understand, especially with giving you these videos, that you know the difference between a two-hour lecture or four or five, 10 to 15 minute videos that you can watch throughout a week. It's so much easier to retain information when it's what we call is distributed over time. Whereas we, unfortunately, we ask you to turn up to a two-hour lecture on a Monday morning at 8 o'clock, and that's called a massed session. So that's two hours of information. And I don't care how good your lecturer is or how engaged you are in the material, to really concentrate for almost two hours and take all that information in. Look, I'm not going to use the word impossible, but geez, it's pretty close to it. We really know it. how much better is it when you've got shorter 10 or 15 minute blocks of information that you can really focus on and retain, you're going to learn more that way where you can revisit it. So really, in, um, in the environment at university, we teach you mass practice. We come and say, right, come to one session a week and do two hours. But we know as experts in skill acquisition, that's not the best way to learn. Um, I know I'm not meant to be saying that, but the reality is we're meant to be learning in more distributed, so four or five, 10 or 15 minute blocks of video and online content are really helpful. And the university system is going that way now because it does understand that learning is better facilitated in shorter chunks of information. But like what I love about this unit is it tells us so much about how we learn, not just for sports skills, but in general. And, and this information is 10 to 20 and 30 years old, 40 years old. And that's only in the, I guess, the teaching aspect that we're coming to this information now. But we've known this in skill acquisition for a long period of time. So I tend to believe that we're, you know, we're trailblazers, if you like, on the learning practicum or the learning continuum, if you like. Um, but really, what we do know, back to the lecture, is we know that learning is better facilitated in short, less, I guess, more often, so more frequent training sessions, 
but a shorter in duration. So if you're doing 90 minutes of practice throughout a week, rather than doing one session of 90 minutes, which is what we would call mass practice, we're better off doing two or three or four blocks of four blocks of 15 minutes or three blocks of 30 minutes or even two blocks of 45 minutes because we're going to retain more information and we get more sort of visits to the practice situation. So in that next slide, well, I've just summarized what is mass practice and what is distributed practice. So mass sessions or mass practice is a shorter amount of sessions, so fewer sessions but a longer in duration, whereas distributed practice are shorter in duration but more frequent sessions. And I can go through all the research and all the information, but what we do know now is distributed practice works better. And it works better for most skills, even though some of the research and mode learning says it depends on the type of skill, and that will come out in this particular lecture. I think we know that it works better for most skills if you can distribute your practice and make it more frequent sessions, but make them shorter. And we know that from lectures. If we have less information, but we have it distributed throughout the week, we're probably more likely going to, I guess, take that information in. Um, the classic experiment that's been used is what's called the Baddeley and Longman, and it really looked at experiment to see, they were trying to find out how quickly someone could learn how to type. So they gave them a, um, a criteria of like, if you could type for 40 words per minute, whatever the criteria was, it doesn't really matter, because what we want to find out is how long did it take them to get to that criteria, or if we did 60 hours of typing, who was better depending on how you distributed your practice? So you could do it four ways in this experiment. So it said, right, how many sessions per day and how many hours per session? So if something was completely massed, so a huge amount of mass practice, it would be the bottom right-hand corner of this particular box. Because if you had two sessions a day that went for two hours each, so four hours per day, you did your 60 hours of typing in 15 days only, so that was massed. If you wanted to be more distributed, you would do 60 days where you had one session for one hour a day over 60 days. And that would be more distributed. Now, what they found was, in the next slide it says, what were the key findings? The key findings was one session a day worked best. They also found it's better if you keep practice sessions short. And also found that 60 hours training with three weeks with two practice a day was actually the worst way to practice so they retained less. So in other words, they found was mass practice was not optimal for learning, but distributed practice was. And so the next slide basically just says is practice sessions can be too long and too infrequent to lead to optimal learning. So we know that practice is better to be distributed. Okay, so more practice sessions and less time on each practice session. And the next slide just says to us, well, why? Why does it work? And the three main things we look at here is people get fatigued less, that means cognitive effort. So in other words, your brain actually hurts after trying to concentrate for too long. So more less cognitive information is better in, I guess, in one block information. We're better off to distribute that over time so we have time to process it. And the third aspect is what we call memory consolidation hypothesis. It just means we've got time to remember it, to recall it. So if we get information more frequently, but less at one period of time, we're more than likely going to retain that information and be able to use it in a game situation as well. So the next thing we look at is what happens to these, I guess, rest periods in between your training sessions or in between your practice trials. And this is another big benefit of looking at your intervals um, between, I guess, trials. Now, it depends on the nature of the skill. For a continuous based skill, it's sort of hard to have rest intervals because the skill is quite continuous. So things like running or cycling or swimming, you have less, I guess, intervals to rest. Therefore, that they're sort of different type of skills. But for most discrete skills, the slide here says mass schedules are more effective than distributed. And this is where I look at the, the rest intervals and I have a bit of a query in the research. Um, this is the main thing we're looking at in between your rest intervals between one child and the next. And it comes back to our lecture on feedback. So this is really key. What we need to understand here is we need time between trials to take in what we've done or haven't done before we get feedback, to then take in the information that was given by a coach or facilitator via feedback, to take that information in, 
to use as our next approach for the trial before we start our next training period, or next, sorry, our next trial. And so that's really important that we understand that. So we need to have a length of time which is long enough for us to be able to do that in between each trial. So that's why it's important to make sure we have a decent amount of time period between each trial. So therefore we need to make sure that the time between one trial and the next isn't too short. It's better if that's a bit longer. And that will go back to the previous slide which looks at it means we can decognify, we can remember, and we don't get as fatigued. So really, what does this lecture actually tell us? It tells us that we're better off to have more training sessions, to have them go for less time, and to have longer rest periods between one trial and the next so we can retain the information. And really, you've got all that information on the slides that I've given you, but that's really all that this lecture is trying to tell us. And that's the main thing that this will be asked in exam situation, and this is how you'll help you with your skills training project. So the last minute to summarise, Really what we're looking at here is for your skills training project, you might be looking at the tennis server or you might be looking at the sport of tennis. So you might be saying, right, if I've got 90 minutes a week, how can I best get these guys to train? Now you might say, that's great, Anthony. You might say, well, six 15-minute intervals are best and that's what's optimal for learning. But the reality is you might be able to get kids to come six times a week. That's not going to happen. So how do you get the information I've just given you in those 10 minutes and put it into a real world, real world setting. This is where we need to take into account what is going to actually occur. So we use the word adherence. So are they likely to do one 90-minute training session? They can turn up for that. But could they turn up for two 45-minute training sessions? And you might say, yeah, in their day-to-day in their -day activities, we could probably get them to train twice a week. Then we say, well, what about three 30-minute sessions? And if you're working with kids, the reality is they're probably not going to be able to get to three different 30-minute training sessions. So you might say, right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have two 30-minute or 40-minute training sessions, and then we're going to give them some homework to do for three or four or five minutes a day. So for the tennis serve, you might give them five minutes a day where they're literally just trying to hit against a brick wall and just hit the ball and make contact with it. But then you might get them to turn up for two half-hour sessions throughout the week. So what we're trying to get you to do here is use these mode learning principles, but let's put them into real life to see what actually works and what doesn't work. So an example might be, right, so we're going to construct for our five-week training program, we're going to do two half-hour sessions, and then we're going to give them 30 minutes of homework. There's nine minutes of practice every week that we think is it meets the scientific principles because it distributes the practice, but also, too, it meets some real-life um, reality. It means they can actually physically do it. So that's the first thing. The second thing what's good about that is when they do practice on their own, they're not having feedback, so they're actually actively involved doing it themselves. So therefore, you're going to avoid that guidance hypothesis so, and actually get them to be active learners. So that's another really good thing about giving them some homework. And we do it at school, not at school, sorry. We do our maths in the class, but then we get homework to do, and we do that in the absence of a teacher. We come back to the teacher and we say what we learned, what we understood, and what we didn't. So that's the good thing about giving them some homework to do for skill acquisition. And I don't think coaches, especially with kids or an early stage of learning, do the homework enough. They rely too much on their physical training sessions with the participants, whereas I think they're better off actually giving them some good homework and make the kids or the people they're with with do their homework and then report back to them and ask them what they learned when they weren't there. So hopefully... There's, I know there's a lot of information on those lecture slides, but I want you to really focus on what I was really presenting in these 14 minutes. Sorry, it was meant to be 10, but you know I go on a bit. But the key things are, how do we distribute our practice sessions, but what's optimal in a learning environment in a real world setting, and try to keep the two together. And that's what I guess the importance of your skills training project is, is to write a training program that meets the, I guess, requirements of what we're saying for skill acquisition, from the main learning principles, but what in real world is something that someone can actually physically do and will do, so what's called adherence. So same thing as the exercise training programs, there's no point writing this awesome training program if people aren't going to have the time to do it. Skills training projects are exactly the same. We try to put our energy in constructing a really great training program which meets those main learning principles which we've been learning these first four weeks, but also too has that good sprinkle of some real life about us where people can actually physically do it. All right, guys, so that finishes our aspects of lectures um, for week four. 
and I'll give you another lecture coming up in the next sort of couple of days, which will be mainly on your assignment and on um, transfer of learning and also to motivation, which we didn't really cover as much in that first four weeks that we should have. All right, thanks guys, and we'll chat soon.